Welcome to lesson 7 in Hydraulics 102. In this lesson we are going to do some gear pump sizing, so some calculations and some equations for gear pumps. So before we start looking at gear pump sizing and equations, first we have to define a couple of basic parameters of gear pumps. The basic parameters of our gear pumps are the number of teeth on the gear, which we mark as Z, so it's easy to count the number of teeth, so 1, 2, 3, 4, etc. The second parameter that we need is the gear module. And if you studied machine design, you know that the module is the unit of size that indicates how big or small a gear is. And what it basically is, it's the ratio of the reference diameter of the gear divided by the number of teeth. And the last basic parameter is the width of the gear, which we can see right here. So this is the width of the gear. Now, because pumps produce flow, flow is our number one priority when choosing a pump. We already talked about gear pumps in the last lesson. We know how fluid, how the work fluid is transferred through the spacing between the sprockets and the space. We already know that the fluid goes in the inlet port, gets trapped in between the gear teeth and the casing of the pump and gets pushed through the outlet port. Now using geometry we can find the exact size of these compartments where our work fluid is trapped when the pump is working. Now just remember this little clearance right here. So if we look at this gear pump up close, let's say this is our inlet port and this is our outlet port, meaning this gear goes around clockwise and this one goes counterclockwise. So fluid gets trapped here and gets pushed on the other side, okay, to the outlet side. Now let's look at this area right here. So this is the area where the fluid is trapped. It's actually the volume because we also have the width of the gear which we can't see on this picture. But this is the area where our fluid gets trapped. Okay, so that's the area we have to multiply with the width of the gear to get the volume of the work fluid that goes through our pump. But when our gear does a full revolution and when it comes into mesh with the other gear, there's a small area right here called the clearance area in gears and there's actually a small volume of fluid that gets transferred back to the inlet side. So this fluid does not go through our pump, it doesn't go to the outlet, instead it goes back to the inlet side. Now we're gonna call this entire area, let's call it area between teeth and let's call this small area clearance area, let's call it delta A, B, D, okay? So when calculating the volume of this space, we have to say that the area actually is the area between the teeth minus this little clearance area between the teeth, because in this area fluid gets trapped and gets brought back to the inlet side. So this times the width of the gear, okay? If we go back, we can see that this is the width of the gear. And right here we have the little clearance area. Okay, and the equation for theoretical flow would be QT is equal to times Z, so this is the number of teeth, and we are putting two times because we have two gears in our pump, remember? If there were n gears, you would put n times z. Now here comes the area part, okay? So area between teeth minus the clearance area between teeth, okay, times b, okay? So this is our volume, and this 
is multiplied by the speed in revolutions per minute. If we look at this first part of the equation, so we have the number of teeth, we have the volume, and because we put 2 times z, this would basically be the specific flow of the pump. So the volume per rotation, because we put 2 times z. So this is the number of teeth. So qp is something we get in centimeters cubed per rotation. Okay, so the theoretical flow would be specific flow rate in centimeters cubed per rotation times the speed in rotations per minute. So when we multiply these two parameters, rotations and rotations cancel each other out and we get the flow in centimeters cubed per minute. Okay. The other way to calculate the theoretical flow would be to say that the volumes of the space between the teeth are equal to the volume of the teeth. Okay, because if you look at a gear, and I'm not gonna draw the entire gear, but if you look at this, if you put another line here, you can see that these two areas would be the same. So we assume that the volume between the teeth are the same as the volume of the teeth. So we have something that's called the pitch diameter of the gear, which we're gonna say it's DO, times pi, times the module of the gear, times B. So this would be the volume of the teeth of the gear. So we can say 2 times DO times pi times M times B and times the speed in revolutions per minute. So this is another way to calculate the flow of a gear pump. Now because of the losses in clearances in the pump, when we calculate the effective flow, so th this was all uh, the theoretical flow without losses, without the efficiency factors, so Q effective would be the theoretical flow times the volumetric efficiencies of the pump. So we have to multiply the theoretical flow with the efficiency, which is always smaller than 1, okay? So the effective flow is going to be smaller than the theoretical flow because we lost some flow in the clearances of the pump. The effective flow would be, Q effective would be the specific flow rate of the pump in volume per rotation times the speed times the volumetric efficiency of the pump. Okay, now let's talk about something that is really important. That's pulsation of flow. Because of the periodical extrusion of the fluid from the gear pump, we have something that's called flow pulsation. And the flow pulsation is directly responsible for the pulsation of pressure as well. And pulsation makes noise and it is not something we want in our system. It is something that we can't make disappear, it is always there in some level. Some pumps have low levels of pulsation, some have less. So how do we calculate flow pulsation? So first let's calculate the frequency of the pulsations. And we do that, let's say the frequency, let me change my color. So let's say the frequency of rotations is F equals Z, which is the number of teeth, times speed in rotations per minute, divided by 60. And this is going to be in hertz, okay? When something is 1 hertz, it means it happens once in a second. If it is 60 hertz, for example, it means it happens 60 times in one second. So 1 hertz is basically second on the minus 1, or 1 divided by second. 
the pulsation of flow has an impact on pressure, so it makes the pressure pulsate as well, and it makes noise while the pump works. Here we can see a diagram of the flow pulsation. On this side, we have the pump that has 12 sprockets or 12 teeth, and on this side, we have a pump that has 20 sprockets or 20 teeth per gear. The X axis is the time and these lines right here are rotations of the shaft. So each line is, th this is basically one rotation of the shaft and of course the gear. And on, on the Y axis we have the amplitude of the pulsation. So you can see that the flow changes with time and that's what's called the flow pulsation. If you compare these two gears, so if you compare the 12 teeth gear with the 20 teeth gear, you can see that the 20 teeth gear has a smaller amplitude, okay? The less the sprockets, the less teeth we have on a gear, the bigger the amplitude of the flow rate oscillation. And if we look down here at the pressure oscillation, we can see that the pressure amplitudes are also smaller on the pump that has the gears with more teeth. And if you think about why is that the case, well, more teeth on the gear means less space in between them to make a bigger difference. More teeth on the gear, less pulsation of flow. Let's look at the equation for the effective torque that is needed on the input shaft of the gear pump. Now we are not going to go into detail uh, with this equation. We're gonna we're gonna talk more about torque in the gear motors sizing section. So now we're just gonna say that the effective torque for gear pumps is the specific flow rate of the pump times the pressure difference, which we get when we add the under pressure. So we take the under pressure, under pressure, and we add over pressure to it. So under pressure in the inlet port of the pump, over pressure on the outlet port. Over pressure. Okay, that's the pressure difference in our pump. So specific flow times the pressure difference divided by 20 times pi times the hydromechanical efficiency of the pump. So this is the equation for the effective torque. Now by using this equation for the effective torque, let's look at how we calculate the needed power on the input shaft of the pump. In other words, this is the power that our electric motor or IC engine has to supply to our pump and pump takes that energy, that mechanical energy, and converts it right from mechanical to fluid flow energy. So we know that the general equation for power is force times velocity, okay? And in our case, this will be the effective power of the pump. This will be the torque, the effective torque of the pump times the angular velocity, right? Because we have rotation. And now we're going to take the this uh, eff effective torque equation and we're going to write, so the effective power of the pump is equal. So we said that the equation for the effective torque is specific flow times the pressure difference divided by 20 times pi times the hydromechanical efficiency. And we're gonna write this angular velocity as RPM, okay, times pi divided by 30, okay? So this is the same. This is how we write the angular speed when we wanna convert it to RPMs. So times RPMs times pi divided by 30, okay? so pi and pi will cancel each other out and what we get here is specific flow rate times 
delta P, pressure difference, times the speed divided by, so we're going to multiply 20 by 30, so 600 times the hydromechanical efficiency. Okay, so here we can see we have QP times NP. What is this? Okay, we talked about it earlier. This is the theoretical flow rate. So this is theoretical flow rate. So now we are going to write the equation for the theoretical flow rate. So that's QP times NP, right? And now let's write the effective flow of the pump equation. So this is, as we know, theoretical flow times the volumetric efficiency of the pump. Okay. And because we had this in our equation for effective power, we're going to write QT is equal to the effective flow of the pump divided by the volumetric efficiency of the pump. Okay, so this is the equation for the theoretical flow. And now when we write effective power of the pump, we will write the effective flow of the pump divided by the volumetric efficiency of the pump. So this is QT. This is QP times NP, as we saw, times delta P divided by the volumetric efficiency, the hydromechanical efficiency times 600. And if you look at this part, you can see that this is actually the total efficiency of the pump. So the volumetric efficiency times the hydromechanical efficiency. So the effective power of the pump would be effective flow rate of the pump times the pressure difference in the pump divided by 600 times the total efficiency of the pump. So this is how we calculate the effective power needed on our input shaft. The flow rate in this case is in liters per minute. Okay, this is the flow rate and our pressure is in bars. And when you when you put these units in this equation, the effective power unit will be in kilowatts. Okay, that's it. Now when we talked about the axial piston uh, pump sizing, I put the lesson from my second course on hydraulics, which explains efficiency factors. So all of these things with efficiency factors, you should already know from that lesson. I didn't think it was necessary to explain it once again. If you don't know why this is used like this, go back to the axial piston pump lesson and look in the resource part for the efficiency factors lesson. This is it for gear pump sizing. Thank you for staying focused and see you in the next lesson in which we will be talking about rotary vein pumps.